Hey there geographers and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we're going to be going into topic four of unit two. We're going to be looking at population dynamics. Now last time we talked about 2.3 where we looked at population pyramids, sex ratios, dependency ratios, and population composition in general. And now we're going to be expanding on a lot of those concepts and ideas. Now before we go into all the different reasons why we see natural births go up or down, we have to talk about some terminology. The first term you're going to have to know is crude birth rate also known as the CBR. What this is looking at is just how many people are born in a given year. To find it, what we're going to do is take the amount of live births in a year and divide it by a thousand people. We also have our crude death rate, or CDR, and you can probably guess it deals with how many people are dying in a year. And just like our CBR, we're going to calculate it pretty similar. We're going to take the amount of people who died in a given year and divide it by a thousand people. Next, we have our natural increase rate, or NIR. Now, sometimes this will also be shown to you as RNI, which would stand for rate of natural increase. Now, what we're talking about here is essentially how much is society growing? To find this, we're going to take our CBR and we're going to minus our CDR. If this is a positive number, it shows that our society is growing. If it is a negative number, it shows our population is actually shrinking. Now, I want to highlight that the NIR is only looking at natural births. So we're not factoring in immigration, emigration, or migration. We're only looking at the natural births that are occurring in the country. So that's important to note because if a country has a negative NIR, they still overall could be growing as a population if they have a lot of immigrants coming into the country. So the real question is now, why do some countries see their natural births go up while others see their natural births go down? To answer this question, we could look at social factors. We could look at how society develops and as they gain more access to wealth, they're able to get better health care. They're able to have more access to medicine and treatments that can lower a society's IMR and also its CDR. Or we could look at education. As societies give more opportunities for both men and women, more people gain access to higher paying jobs and can participate participate more in society. This would lower the TFR as now women are actually participating in the workforce and have less time to have kids. So our family sizes start to decrease and our population growth rate goes down with it. So I just mentioned the IMR and TFR and these are important concepts to understand. The IMR is the infant mortality rate and it's a sad metric. It looks at the amount of children who die before they get past the age of one. To find this, what we would do is take the amount of deaths of children under one and divide it by a thousand live births. The TFR, on the other hand, stands for our total fertility rate. Here we're taking the average amount of babies and dividing it by women. This shows us, on average, how many kids are women having. And that also shows us our family sizes. When this number is going down, that means our family sizes are decreasing. When the number is higher, we are having larger families. Societies that have a high IMR oftentimes are going to have a higher TFR. This is because women are going to be having more children, expecting some of them to die. So they'll have a family of eight and maybe only expect six to unfortunately live. This impacts population growth significantly, especially as we start to see society develop. But we're going to go into that more in our next video when we talk about the demographic transition model. Now, before we go back into the other reasons why we see population growth change, I want to highlight one more thing with our total fertility rate, and that's the replacement rate. For society to actually keep its current population, we have to have a TFR of 2.1. This is the replacement rate. If we are seeing our TFR drop below there, we're actually going to see our population decrease. We're not having enough children to be able to make up for our current population. If we're above 2.1, well, we're going to start to see some population growth. Politically, we could look at how the government changes population growth by implementing pronatalist and antinatalist policies. These are policies we'll cover in depth in 2.7, but these policies have a big influence. Some governments actually will pay for all the child care. They'll offer tax incentives to families for having kids, while others will put laws in place to prevent large families or use propaganda to manipulate people to try and convince them to decrease their family sizes. All of these can change the growth rate of a society. Another political factor that could impact population growth could actually be just stability. If you're living in an area where you don't feel safe, if you feel like there's a lot of uncertainty, you're less likely to have more children because you won't feel like it's a good environment to be able to bring up kids in. When looking at economics, we can see a bunch of different factors as well that influence our population growth. 
For example, societies that are developing and have more of an agricultural based economy, where we see a lot of people working in subsistence agriculture, are going to have larger family sizes. That's because the families need help on the farm, and so they have larger families to be able to support it. However, as we see countries develop and we see more people move to the cities and we have more urbanization occur, well, we start to see family sizes go down. Children are no longer as economically advantageous and they actually cost a lot of money in the city. So we start to see changes. The family size gets smaller. You don't need to have a large family to help you out as much. And now too, just living in the city has other costs. And you're probably also now focused on other careers. So you have less time for larger families. Lastly, we could talk about environmental factors. For example, some societies are still in subsistence agriculture and they rely heavily on the land around them to be able to feed themselves and to be able to provide for their family. And they have those larger families like we already talked about to be able to help around the farm. Well, if we're starting to see more desertification and more depletion of the natural resources, that's going to put more of a strain and burden on the farmers and the people living in these societies to get enough food. So sometimes we start to see families actually having more kids so they have more help around the home to be able to get food and to be able to support the family. The issue there is it creates a cycle then where now we're taking more out of the land and depleting the resources at a faster rate. But we could also look at too just the environment within a neighborhood or a city. Families will look around them before having kids. Uh, do I have the right school district for my child? Do I have resources to support them? Is there enough room for them to go outside and play? All of these things would get factored in for the decision of families, and it all impacts our population growth. Now, we only just started to scratch the surface on for all the different reasons why population growth changes. And before we wrap this up, I want to make sure you understand one more concept, and that's doubling time. Doubling time is the amount of time it would take for a population to double. This is important for societies to focus on because if they don't understand what's happening with their population growth, they're not going to be able to plan accordingly and they're going to run into some pretty big issues. Countries need to study what's happening with the demographics in their country so they can better make decisions on how to address the needs and wants of their people. So that about does it for 2.4. Now next time we're going into 2.5 and I can't stress this enough, it's going to be a huge video. Now, hopefully not in length, but in content. We're going to be going into the demographic transition model and the epidemiological transition model. These are so important for this unit and this entire class. So make sure you subscribe so you get notified when that video goes live. Also, if you need help with reviewing any of these concepts, make sure you check out the ultimate review packet. It'll help you get an A in your class and a five on that national exam. All right, that's all the time we have for today. I'm Mr. Sin, and until next time, Geographers, I'll see you online.